Hello, and uh, welcome to the ASAP Executive Spotlight. Today, we're going to be talking about mergers and acquisitions. We're going to be talking about um, some unique and interesting ways uh, to look at, you know, private equity or investment capital, uh, different strategies and techniques to grow your business. Um, among the, the topic we might be talking about is how do you think ahead to grow and scale your business so it's attractive? to a company to eventually buy. We might talk a little bit about exit strategy. If you're a search firm owner um, or you play in that town acquisition space and you say, okay, I'm not going to sell in the next year or two, but eventually I might. Well, how do I, what do I think about now to build my company where it becomes uh, more valuable and more attractive to a buyer, right? And so um, a, a wise man that I knew once said, um, build it now as if you're going to sell it later. And if you think about that in your business model, uh, then that can help you to scale and grow and become more attractive. So um, without further ado, let me talk about some of the people on the panel today. And I'll introduce them quickly and let them kind of tell you a little bit about who they are and what they do. So Mr. Bill Bromley out of Dallas with uh, IBB, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. My name is Bill Bromley, uh, Managing Director of Investment Business Brokers, also known as IBB. Uh, we do buy side representation. So if you're looking to acquire a company within your vertical or maybe even outside your vertical, we're basically your hired headhunters. We'll work within your targets and criteria of what it is you're looking for and help you find that company and work you through the acquisition process. Uh, we also do sell side transactions, um, taking people to market, uh, doing valuations on their company, setting price expectation as to what we feel we can get you for at market having discussions based around what we would list you for and the range of expectation of offers you could expect, and also the type of different deal structures that are put in place depending on the buyer and the offer. Um, so basically a no surprise uh, start to the process. So you can kind of have a, an expectation of how your, your process will go and what to expect. Um, we also assist buyers with bank financing. Uh, we find that's a big niche for us. Uh, we can advertise for as little as 10% down. We can help people acquire companies, uh, driving that growth through acquisition model. Um, instead of building out your own infrastructure and building up more sales teams and more marketing teams, just simply going and acquiring another company for as little as 10% down to expand on your organization, to expand on your revenues, uh, to expand on your customer base, uh, and also your team. Um, so that's, that's really, uh, that, that's, that's what, that's what our focus is. We do. We, we are industry agnostic. We deal across almost all industries. I always tell everybody we don't focus on industry. We focus on transaction and marketing. We know how to market your business. We know how to find the buyers. We know how to find the sellers. And we know how to get you through the valuation process and get you through the bank process. Um, we do have a heavy focus on staffing, recruiting, search firms, HR companies. It seems to be a very exciting space right now, highly acquisitive. Um, and we also do um, quite a few other industries as well. Uh, with last thing there within the staffing industry, since I know we've got a few of you today, those that focus on healthcare, IT, SaaS or software as a service, um, software development, uh, these are highly, highly sought after industries right now. And marketing is now becoming a big placeholder as well as people are moving more towards the AI realm of marketing. Uh, you're seeing some of these AI companies roll up some of the more traditional type marketing companies uh, and, and apply an AI type service or platform uh, within that business, but buying basically buying up the customer base. Uh, once awesome. again, probably investment business brokers, in Dallas, Texas. So one thing uh, for everyone to know is um, below in the chat feed and in the thread, everyone in this call on this panel will be hashtagged. And so, you know, if someone wants to reach out to Bill, that'll be a good way uh, to be able to do that. Uh, Monty, uh, up in Colorado. Monty, tell us a little bit about your firm and what you guys are doing. Sure. I'm uh, Monty Mertz. I'm the managing partner of High Country Executive, High Country Executive Search or the High Country Search Group out of Denver. Um, we're kind of a slow, steady growth. We've been up and running since 2002 and have, we started as a finance and accounting group, bolted on a staffing group, bolted on a technology group, as well as a upstream oil and gas, and, and finally a private equity real estate type group. So there's five different groups that are kind of running on a, on a very similar platform. Uh, as far as the, the M&A world, you know, I haven't really determined my exit outside of continue to grow, which we've run about 10% growth almost every year for 20 years. And that ends up being a, uh, 
fifteen million dollar company pretty quickly if you if you do that kind of growth and really just building it so that we can be acquired. Not that we want to be acquired or we figured out how that's going to be done, but just you want to be able to run it so that if you're not there or if somebody else wants to take it and run with it, it is just a, a seamless type scenario. So that's that's always been my mindset. I really appreciate that you're on the call, Monty, because of the diversification. You guys have really scaled and grown year over year over year. Culture, you're great at culture. But also uh, a topic we'll talk about with Bill and Monty is, and, and John Bartos as well, is, is how you make your firm get a higher multiplier. You know, and obviously Monty's doing staffing and that's one of those things. And we'll get some more expertise from the group on that. Um, Bartos, tell us a little bit about what you guys are doing with uh, Starfish Partners. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. Uh, exciting topic for sure. Yeah. Uh, so I joined Starfish Partners about a year ago and my role is chief investment officer. So my role there is really to work with the mid-market search firms all over the globe and uh, we do two things at Starfish. Uh, one is we provide capital for search firm owners. Capital could be used for equity plans, for growth. Uh, they want to buy the owner out, uh, any, any of those kind of things. And then we also offer merger and acquisition opportunities very specifically. And we have a, a couple different target markets places that we're actually looking for. But right now, uh, we brought in nine different firms. Uh, we're about 300 million total, but that also includes our franchise systems within our uh, within our uh, investment portfolio. Uh, we now have uh, Next Level Exchange, Sanford Rose Associates, a new uh, franchise model, which I'm also running called Dimensional Search. Um, mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, we're just putting on search firms, you know, mid-market search firms that are looking to aggressively grow, build and scale. Awesome. Love what you guys are doing um, there and the association with, you know, a pioneer uh, like Jeff K and K big mm -hmm. and everything. there. Um, Boris Epstein, uh, uh, West Coast representative, uh, as well as Alan Fisher. But Boris, tell us a little bit about what you guys got going on and, and your past history as well. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. And Hale, uh, great to be here. Um, I am uh, one week into uh, the launch of a new recruiting venture. Uh, so brand uh, spanking you, uh, haven't even really gone live uh, to the to the world, uh, zero in place, uh, including um, myself is not on payroll yet. Um, but before that, oh, the, the, the name, name of the new venture is First 10, 1ST10. Uh, it's based on the premise that there's nothing more important uh, to a startup than the first 10 engineers they hire. So we're exclusively working with early stage founders to build their early stage engineering teams. Uh, but before that, uh, I started a company called Bink, uh, started in 2002. Uh, we ran the company for 19 years. We were uh, always focused on the technology industry, probably best known for pioneering what the tech industry now refers to as uh, RPO. Um, during our time, we were really good at helping companies uh, hire tough to find um, engineering talent, uh, but at a very aggressive uh, pace. Uh, so we, we did really well at that. We grew to about 150 employees, um, uh, ran rate up to 30 million in annual revenue. And then we ended up getting acquired in 2021. Um, a little unconventionally, uh, we uh, got bought by Robinhood, uh, the uh, mobile trading uh, platform. They bought our 80 person team at the time uh, to double their in-house uh, recruiting team. Uh, we considered uh, an offer from a very large uh, RPO. We also considered going the private equity route, but we ended up going in-house. Uh, we thought that was the kind of better route for our uh, team. A lot of lessons learned. Uh, excited to share as a uh, topics uh, service. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's finish uh, with John McSpadden and Alan Fisher. Just give us a quick intro, John. And uh, I'm going to readjust just a little bit to make sure I don't run out of power. I'm at a conference in Baltimore this week. So, John McSpadden, tell us what you got going on. Appreciate it, Jeremy. Thanks for uh, having me on. Nice to, for those you haven't met, nice to meet you guys. Um, background, like Jeremy said, started off in MRI, kind of went a, uh, uh, probably a non-traditional route, more into executive search after I left, left MRI. So uh, run ESG, uh, we partner up with uh, professional and technology services. So think big four, non-big four, think your MBBs of the world. Private equity, uh, we mainly work within the C-suite, within their port codes. Um, We've really phase two of our growth as an executive search firm is we've been moving into areas where 
you know, we're using executive search as a catalyst, right? So we go in there, we sell, you know, some mini RPO engagements where they might be looking to hire 20, 30, 40 kind of mid, mid-level staff ranging from salaries from 80 to 150,000. We did launch a, a secondary business called 10X Advisory. Uh, this is where we actually hire big four talent out of markets like South Africa, uh, Latin America, specifically Colombia, Brazil, um, even uh, moving into some some areas of Canada. And we actually deploy them with our clients on U.S. engagements. They'd always come back. And for the roles that we can't fill on the in the mid-level, we use that business to kind of as a staff augmentation group. So um, background, I, uh, I launched a, another firm shortly after uh, uh, Jeremy and I you know, kind of went the search path route uh, called Mac and Associates. I sold that to DHR International, which is a top five, you know, retained search firm. Learned a lot on, you know, what not to do in that type of situation is more of an aqua hire type acquisition. Um, so anyway, glad to be on the call. It's a little bit about, about myself and, and the firm, but glad to be on this call because, you know, m and is a big part of, I think, what all of us kind of got in this business for. So It really is. Some people, that's the big vision, you know, to get that big payday. And I think a big topic today needs to be <clears throat> lessons learned because a few of you on this call have been acquired and it didn't always work out or it worked out for a period of time, but not long term. And so we can talk a little bit about that today. Give people some ideas on things to look for, things to ask uh, if they are uh, being pursued. Um, Alan Fisher, tell us about what uh, what you guys got going on in Los Angeles. Hey, Jeremy. Uh, our firm is Premier Financial Search. Um, been uh, been around for 22 years. Last five years, we've scaled from three employees and a million in revenue to 12 employees and, and about five and a half million in revenue. Focus specifically in the world of accounting. Um, almost all that's in, in the world of public accounting, CPA firms. We also uh, assist our clients as they go through M&A. Um, but, uh, you know, in the process of, of guiding your clients, you see some of the, some of the mistakes they make, some of the, some of the strategies they employ. And of course, you say, um, how can I be thinking about our legacy and what's next for us? Absolutely. That's awesome. So that's a that's a good intro so that everyone has a bit of a feel for the flavor and DNA of the makeup of the group today. Um, so the first question, I just kind of want to put this out to the group is why should a search firm consider M&A possibly as a way to either grow or why should they be thinking about M&A um, even if they're not looking to be bought in the for in this next year or two, how should they be thinking about it in terms of how they build their business, how they scale and grow? Uh, so let's let's put that first to Bill Bromley and then let's go around the table a little bit and talk about what your best advice might be to someone listening to the podcast today. Bill. Yeah, thank you. Um, so a couple points uh, in utilizing M&A. One is you're a strategic buyer. If you're looking to buy something within your vertical or something within uh, your service base of what you do. Um, a, uh, the business can compl be complementary to yours. Uh, B, you already have industry experience within that industry and can uh, quickly acquire a company with the knowledge that you currently have. Uh, we, we also call this expedited growth. You know, some people can build out a new division, get into a new service base, but they got to hire more recruiters, do additional marketing, um, go find a new customer base, uh, as opposed to where you can do it with one bite. Uh, you can go out, buy a firm, you uh, automatically purchase additional revenue, additional profits, um, increase the size of your organization or your team, um, increase your customer base. And then lastly, you're able to cross sell. So you now you can offer new services to your existing clients um, as a, and use that as another revenue generator for the business. Um, so, so that's kind of on the buy side. Uh, and then on the sell side, you know, if you know, hey, I'm looking to retire in three to five years or I'm getting a little bit of burnout, and I'd like to get into another industry or find a different season of life, you can start working with an M&A advisor and seeing what the current value of your business is. We do that by doing evaluation on the company um, and, and setting price expectation. Some people like the price that they can get now. They didn't know they could get that much and they're ready to go to market sooner than later. And others will look at the price and say, hey, I'm looking at a $3 million exit. I'd really like to be at $5 million by the time I exit my company. How do I get there and what's the timeline to get there? And is there any creative ways or things that may be frowned on at market that we can fix now to make my company more desirable? 
So working with an M&A advisor several years before your actual exit can give you some good strategy and um, help you get more focused on what it is you need to do as you plan for that exit. Yeah, that's absolutely um, awesome. Um, Bartos, I mean, what are your thoughts and ideas on why search firms, regardless of where they're at in their timing, but why should they be thinking about this as a topic in terms of how they grow their business? Yeah. And, and if we want to talk about specifically growth, um, if you look at most search firms out there, they just grow based on profitability. So uh, they set a certain amount aside and say, OK, I'm going to use this kind of capital to continue to grow, scale and build. And the, the good news about, you know, bringing in capital, and we're just talking capital specifically, is that now you have money to do what you need to do. You know, you, OK, I'm going to I'm going to scale this year and I'm going to spend some time maybe building a, a staffing part of my business. Well, that doesn't start in 90 days. It's not going to be profitable in 90 days. So you've got to have some runway with capital to, to help you get that rock and rolling. Um, I, I really like um, my first firm, Jonathan Scott International, was bought in 2012. I, I started in 1999. We grew, build and scale. And I was purchased very specifically, as Bill mentioned, for a strategic reason. Uh, we really did a ton of business in the healthcare IT space, Epic, Cerner and, and uh, consultants you know, all over the United States. So I was actually a strategic pur uh, purchase for a very big contract staffing firm who wanted to continue to grow and build a scale. And the big attraction for me wasn't so much I was going to cash out. The big attraction for me is now I've got capital. <laughs> now I've got money to really take this thing and scale it. And that's the problem you got with a small business. What happens to all this is this. You know, we start making some coin. You know, business owners do make some, some money. Our lifestyle doesn't stay the same, does it? It keeps going up and up and up. So the problem you got is you want to eke some of that capital out of your business, but mama needs shoes. And it may be more than one pair a week. Who knows what it is, right? But so you, you you can't then take the capital away from the business to continue to grow and build and scale. So when you're looking at a partner, you know, to bring capital into business to help you grow, really you have to have a partner that's very synergistic to what you're looking at doing. Because my first acquisition that I went through uh, wasn't the perfect fit. Is I'm sure some stories you'll hear in, in the future uh, from everybody here on what happened with their acquisition as well. Just two cents there. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Um, and I've got I've got some really interesting questions for each of you because you have these different pieces of the puzzle of today's call. Um, but so, Monty, um, you guys have not only done direct placement and full time placement and you've diversified in some different industries. You have an awesome per desk average in terms of profit margin for the amount of people you guys have. It's you guys are rocking and rolling out there. Um why did you first decide to get into IT contract staffing? You know, some people, you know, view consulting or staff AUG as different than perm placement. You know, what? why did you guys decide to do it and how has it been valuable for your company? Well, I think that, uh, you know, the biggest thing for us and even my story is uh, this was this is just a failed solo venture in that it was meant to be one person. But I've, I've been always sort of a structure and consistent structure type guy and as as things grow if you're doing it right then you know i think that's sort of the acquisition thought in my head is if you do this right why wouldn't somebody want to buy this and how are they going to be looking at it but you know 2008 things kind of went off the rails and our really solid um firm f a group turned into yeah we'll, we'll take anybody that, uh you know any any offer came out came out contract to hire or contract in general so that that ended up bolting on a, a staffing group that we have just kind of stuck with for 12 years and really grown that. And then as as different, you know, I've been very opportune. I'm not trying to grow at a certain rate, but hiring opportunistically, if I, you know, if I looked at this group that, that we're chatting with today and said, would, would, would somebody be interested in taking me on if I had this guy or this guy or this guy? That's really been it. You know, I, I, I look at we were talking prior to, um, to filming this with Bill saying, Hey, these are really nice niches. Like, yeah, that, that makes sense. I, if, a, if an IT guy comes by that really has some good skills, which did somebody fell in my lap. Um, and we were able to bolt him on with just the exact same processes and, um, and definitions and everything. It, it's just been a real easy. We were also to talk about it, just brought somebody on that is, you know, their intention is, Hey, you've done this five times. I want to be the sixth one. I want to bring on another group. So, 
strategically looking at what those groups are, but I don't care, you know, if somebody wants to do drones, if they feel like that's something that really works and ties in um, and will work in our process, let's do it. So that's, it's been a, that's led to a steady growth and, and never really having to take a step backwards, kind of the, the snowball process, just keep going. That's, that's interesting. It. Yeah. Thanks for sharing all that. So Bartos, Boris Epstein, John McSpadden, you guys have all been bought before. You've sold a firm and gone through that. And then I recently did with, with Bill. What kind of multipliers, if you guys don't mind sharing, were you either able to get or were you seeing a range of multipliers when you were looking at these different buyers that might have been uh, looking at you? And so I want to get you guys' perspective. And then I want to ask Bill because he gets a lot of market intel on, on multipliers and how do firms get a higher one or a lower one. And he probably knows what the market is for search firms. Um, but yeah, let's start with uh, McSpadden and then we'll do Boris and then, and then Bartos. What, what do you have to say on like multipliers and, uh, you know, what you were able to, 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 you know, only sell what you're, share what you're comfortable with, obviously. <laughs> no, of course. I mean, well, that's a, that could be a tricky question depending upon, it seems like on this call, we just have a lot of different type of, you know, search and staffing type businesses, whether even, even some RPO all of them have different multiples. Right. And I think if you look at the market as a whole, you know, I think it's, I, I think the last numbers were something like 46 or 47 percent of search firms, right? Search firm revenue, true search firm revenue, just say say retained or contingent, right? So cause those those are two separate areas of search, and you have staffing, you have RPO, you have technology, you have all the types of things that are now moving into the business. On the search firm side of it, when you take that percentage, you know, those are really independent owners, and when I say independent owners, these were big billers that left MRI, big billers that left executive search firms, went on their own. They're still 80, 90 percent of their firm's revenue, maybe three, four, five million, two million, whatever the case may be. You know, that multiple, in my opinion, is way down because it becomes an aqua hire approach at that at that point. Right. Really, majority of the revenue that a another firm is going to acquire is really you. Right. Even more so in your staff, because even for myself, I mean, I'm, I'm you know, I've been doing this 20 years. I'd say I'm still a big biller, even though I have my own search firm. I have employees. You know, I'm still a very huge percentage of the, of the firm's revenue. What I've found is that. The multiplier on that, the multiple, you'll never get past the aqua hire. Will be a little bit of cash up front. You'll get some type of payout structure over the next two, three, four, five years. A lot of them is based on hitting new milestones, even to even to capture that. That's the reason we moved into you know opening up 10x advisory to bring in a staffing arm, right? A low co low cost, high profit margin staffing business where then we can gain another multiple, you know, a few multiples in there, you just won't get on the search business. So I think a lot of times it depends on the structure of your firm. You know, if you're a, there's not many, you know, K Bassman's of the world, which, you know, love Jeff K a ton, you know, but he's sitting, you got Jeff and Nick sitting at top of K Bassman and you have a lot of independent desks underneath there. Most search firms don't start that way. Most search firms start by individuals like us, Jeremy, and, and others that move out, you know, they're big billow, they start their firm, they're still a huge percentage of the revenues. And to me, the multiples just aren't there. You know, I, I won't even look at a business, um, you know, if it comes my way by, by a broker or anyone else that if it's a it's a 15 year old search firm, you know, two guys that have, have built up two or three million, but they want to exit the next six months. It's all the values with them. Right. So the multiple, I think, becomes you know tremendously low versus if you have a search firm where, you know, you might have five, six, seven independent practices within that firm and big billers underneath you versus if you own a staffing business or an RPO. I think staffing or in the interim business probably carries, you know, one of the best multiples in, in our industry. So I'll, I'll stop there because yeah. I could spend, no, I could spend an and, hour talking and, about this subject. <laughs> <laughs> well, and if no one kind of, you know, connected the dots, if you can build a business where 80 to 90% of the revenue is not the owner, now you've got something that you're going to be able to sell if you're looking to walk away at a higher rate. But if you're a billing manager model, where you are the owner and a lot of that revenue, A, you have to stay on for them to get any value out of it whatsoever. Um, and they might have, a you know, those long earnouts associated with it. It still could make sense if the strategic merger has a strategic component to it for you. Um, but that's a good point. Um, Boris, what are you what are your thoughts overall on valuation and multipliers as you're building a firm? Yeah, I'll, I'll share what I learned uh, going into the acquisition and then going through the acquisition process and just know, you know, my my uh, experience is dated back to early 20, late 2020, early 2021. So the market might have shifted. I should be curious how the market has shifted. But what I learned back then was the, the multiple range for the, you know, for, for, for the range of 
staffing industry businesses was somewhere between uh, 3x uh, EBITDA profit uh, up to about 8x on the high end. Um, the low end typically started with contingency firms, that kind of prototype that John uh, just described, big builder, contingency firm, maybe a little bit of container. Next up would be retained, then next up would be staffing, and then next up is RPO. Um, another thing that I learned that was really interesting is a lot of buyers have minimums that they like to target, so criteria for, for acquisition. So I found that 10 million revenue, 1 million in profit was a, was a, was a table stakes. Uh, for for getting into some uh, you know meaningful acquisition uh, discussions, and then as your uh, revenue and profit grew, so did the multiple. So that's an interesting strategy to explore, um, kind of like multiple arbitrage almost almost via acquisition. Uh, and I'm sure you know a, a large search firms uh, look at acquiring um, companies as uh, for that specific uh, benefit. You're worth more. At 100 million revenue, you know, 10, 15 million in profit than you are at 10 million, uh, 1 million, same exact business. Um, so that's something that I've uh, learned over. Yeah, the that's. Year. I love what you said about you know, kind of three to eight, right? There, that that's hopefully a good range uh, that people could at least have a not rough idea. And you know, one friend that I knew, uh, and I won't mention the exact name, um, but a good buddy of mine had built a firm on the West Coast. And it was 100% uh, healthcare IT contract staffing. And I think his multiplier was approaching eight. Uh, it, a combination of the fact that the recurring revenues in contract staffing is much more valuable uh, than perm placement, which seems to be very transactional. Um, and then the other thing was uh, he was super niched. And so he ended up being a strategic acquisition for whoever it was that was acquiring him. And so a strategic acquisition with lots and lots of uh, recurring revenue can get the higher multipliers. Um, John, uh, you've obviously, you know, you've already been bought once and then now you're playing in the space of M&A and, and capital. Uh, what are your thoughts on this subject? Yeah, so um, if we look at the marketplace, uh, the marketplace always rewards size uh, of firms and then consistency, right? Not growth, not always growth, consistency. So there lies the problem with, with, executive search firms, because what happens when a bad marketplace happens, obviously, the consistency thing <laughs> kind of goes out the window. So so if you look at when you look at valuations of EBITDA via the marketplace, you'll see the SaaS based software companies up in the 20s. I mean, um, but I'm going to put some very specific numbers for you guys to give you real life here. Klein Hirsch was one of the most successful companies that sold in our industry. Huge from a, uh, you know, 17, 16 million EBITDA. I'm just huge in profit numbers. They went for a six, all right? Uh, Lucas Group went for roughly six or seven. I got I to remember what that was. Right now, Corn Ferry, if you look at their numbers, uh, their market cap, they're a seven. That's all they are. So from an executive search perspective, a couple things to think about. If I'm an owner right now, I'm going to ask myself, do I pass the bus test? All right. Which means if I get hit by a bus today, what's my business do? Um, well, if the if the answer is changes negatively, then I don't even think three to five times EBITDA is the right multiplier for that business. I have a business right now that uh, uh, gentleman's in his 80s, monster, great, phenomenal brand, uh, retained executive search firm. Uh, unfortunately, he's 60 percent of the revenue can't sell. He's 81, trying to get an exit strategy. No one's buying. Why? He leaves, bus test, revenue declines. He has all the relationships. So if you think about that, um, I sold my first firm for a little over four, and uh, which is typically one times revenue. And, and how they tell you, you know, when they say, hey, your search firm is worth one times revenue, here's how the math works there. They figure your 25% profit times four is one times revenue. You know, it's four times EBITDA, right? So that's how that math works. Um, I would say you know, the executive search firm today is worth anywhere from if they can pass the bus test three to five times. Now, you put recurring revenue in there, you see lots of contract staffing firms based on size, consistency, not only getting seven, eight, nine and up. You know, so so what we're doing at Starfish and this is a little advertisement is what we do is we take when they when they merge with us, we put reoccurring revenue streams with those firms. 
So instead of a three to five times uh, EBITDA worth, we're trying to get it to a 12 or a 15 by putting recurring revenue streams in. Because again, marketplace rewards, size, and consistency, recurring revenue. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you know, you guys have NLE, which has tons of subscription based pricing revenue model in that. In that. SRA. Yeah. Yeah. SRA yeah. franchise system. So you have a lot of royalties and, 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 and that's all under one umbrella, which mm -hmm. has those different revenue streams increasing that that multiplier, which is cool. Um, so, Alan Fisher, we haven't talked to you a lot yet and maybe you haven't been bought yet, but what kinds of. Um, questions do you have for this group and then i also do want to circle back around to bill also to kind of get what he's uh, he, he knows the valuation stuff inside and out uh alan any any particular questions as you kind of continue to build and scale your business i went down the road about five years ago with a potential acquirer and they were talking valuations that were really similar to what john just described mentioned um something very similar to the bus test and then one of the one of the questions I had for myself was, if they're only offering a value which is about one times revenue, why not just continue to work and build the business and extract as much profit as possible? So, one of the things that I realized is, you got to figure out who you are, and you got to figure out what it is that you're trying to do. If it's just extract as much income or profit, maybe it's staying independent. But then there's the other component, which is, do we care about a legacy? What about our employees? How can we make sure that they're properly incentivized and they're retained? So, uh, and this is a question maybe for Bill and maybe for John. If you're a business where you're the owner and, and a rainmaker and you're, you've got substantial profit, how would you reinvest that profit to create something that is saleable? Yeah. Bill, why don't you take that first and then John after? Absolutely. So okay, let me just understand the question. So you have significant profit. How do you reinvest it so that the company is cyclical? Is that? So you have a lot of profit because it's direct hire. A lot of that profit is based on what the rainmaking owner generates, but you don't have a business which is going to get a, a, a great multiple. So instead of just, you know, putting that money in the bank at 5%, whatever it is today, how do you reinvest that in the business so that yeah. now you've got something where you can get the right valuation and create a legacy and protect your employees? Yeah. It, great it's question. a great question. I wish a lot of people would have the mindset of thinking that way before they ever, ever even decided to go to market. I'm sure a lot of people would have a, diff, a lot of different answers, but if you're the rainmaker, my first gut punch for this one is I would invest in my team, my organization. You want to get past you being the rainmaker. Um, you know, because what you have at that point is an owner dependent business that's going to be very hard to sell. And once again, like uh, John had said, it becomes an aqua hire. So the more people that you can put in place to fill these roles and positions to remove yourself from the from the business so that you can work more on the business instead of in the business, that is more of a desirable company. People want to buy something that when the owner steps out, they can continue to run on their own. There's people within the organization that can move up through the ranks to take on some of those positions or duties of, of, of the previous owner. Because a lot of people are looking at this as an investment. They don't want to buy a job. They want to buy an investment. So I would start finding people that can do the, can do the work. A, make placements. B, uh, are ambitious. Uh, C, willing to take on challenge where you can set growth expectations or, or financial benchmarks uh, for the company in front of them, maybe offering them some type of bonus, grow the company to this. I'll give you X out of that. Um, so I would invest in my team first and foremost and try to remove myself from the business as much as possible so that when I, when I do finally go to market, hey, I cannot show up to work for six months and my company will still run the same. The positions are still coming in to be filled. The placements are still being made. My team is self-managed. That is, that is a true business owner. You know, a lot of us think we're business owners, but we're truly self-employed. And you want to get away from the self-employed model and you want to be more of a business owner because now you actually have something that can be packaged and sold. And then if you can start, you know, then there's other things down the road, building those recurring revenue models and stuff like that, that are now going to not only make it desirable, but start to increase that multiple on the business. 
as we transition to John, I want to slightly reframe it because John's owned a search firm as well. And you've hired and managed people. And John, you've been a big biller. So that's scary. And Alan's question, if you let's say that you build 2.3 mil and everyone else on your team has a per desk average of 500, that's an awesome high PDA firm, big biller rainmaking model. And Alan has has had that type of firm and a lot, that's a good firm. You know, that's a good lifestyle business. How do you take that first step? And then how do you kind of slowly get there, uh, John, uh, to where you can make your company more sellable and more profitable or more, more high, a higher valuation? Yeah. And, and by the way, uh, Alan, phenomenal question, uh, because most of my conversations start with search firm owners. And I've probably talked, I don't know, 500 of them in the last seven months. Right. Uh, when do you want to exit? When do you want to exit? You know, and then how much money do you need when you exit? What do you need? Seven million bucks, eight million bucks. And, and then what I do is actually work backwards on the how, how to make that actually happen. So let's talk about that. You got, you got more issues than somebody else has to do your work for you. Because ta let's take a look at the big issue of you guys. What'd you guys do before you started your own firm? Who'd you work for? Why'd you leave? So the biggest issue with search firms is, okay, let's say I find a Jeremy or a Monty or an Alan. You know, I got McSpadden coming to work for me. I'm excited. I got the big guns of the industry working for me. What the hell? The question is, how am I going to keep them? All right. So the biggest problem we have with our industry is not so much I hire great people. It's they finally say, geez, Jeremy says, John's only given me 50%. What the hell is he doing with the rest of the 50%? I want more than 50%. And then that's how our industry grew. And we're a bunch of two, three person search firms that are out there. So there's two things that have to be done. And we'll go to the exit strategy in a second. One is you do have to hire the right people to come in to start taking them over for what you're doing. Instead of being a phenomenal biller, phenomenal at business development, we then have to become a phenomenal servant leader and, and training development individual. Now, it's a transition process. So we bring people in and they take part of our business maybe and teach them the skills. We have to hire right because we hire a hundred thousand dollar person. You give them enough business to make a half a million dollars. Don't bring it down to a hundred thousand dollars. That's how this thing works. So we got to hire right. We got to take our business out, but then we have to change. We have to become a servant leader. And this is what most people don't get servant. If you look at a Jeff K or a Dan Charney, how are they managing a 25, a $300 million firm? And how are they managing rock stars? They're not telling them what to do. Imagine you uh, managing Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, uh, and, and you're you're managing it at, and, and you're managing them from a, a Olympic hockey team or excuse me, basketball team, not hockey team, obviously. Um, you're not telling them what to do. So what really has to happen is you have to change as a leader. You go from command and control to now you have to be a servant leader. Two, you got to restructure your organization. You have to have an organization that's more like a professional services firm like a partnership within a law firm or a CPA firm. That way you have people who have actually skin in the game. We don't build and scale. And then all of a sudden they leave. Then you bring somebody else up and then they leave. And then Holy smokes, you're employing the world, but not, not for your benefit. So that's the second thing is making sure that your organization is structured in a way that you're going to keep them once you find them. And then the issue we all struggle with is we're big billers. How do we, how do we bring the right people in and build, grow and scale? And so those really three things need to happen in order for that transition to transition to work. I want to ask Monty and Boris. So we're talking about culture retention because part of scaling and growing is you finally hire a couple of really good people. They're good. They're billing. And to your point, Bartos, so many times then they go, well, well I could go do this on my own and keep a hundred percent, you know? And, and so as you guys were building Bink, uh, Boris, did you guys have an ESOP or, or a partner program or did you what how did you adjust it when those big companies were trying to pull your people out? You're in RPO. That was common, wasn't it? Yeah, we did. We did a couple of things. Um, it was it was incredibly competitive, especially the better you get, uh, because the better you get, the more uh, high visibility your talent becomes uh, to your uh, to your competitors. Um, we competed on on a couple of things. Uh, one, we had. Uh, great clients and we offered our recruiters the ability to work on the inside of those clients so recruiters were attracted to getting to work on the inside of airbnb the inside of square the inside of uh you know robin hood uh just as a value proposition they didn't have to go to work for these companies exclusively they got to work on each project for like a six-month period 
and then move on. So we built a really cool uh, kind of culture around that. And then the second thing that we doubled down on, because it was really, one, it was important to us, two, we identified it as a, as, as, um, a, a way that we could compete um, versus our clients, our clients um, or companies that would, that would poach our talent. They had, you know, billions of dollars in funding. They could afford, uh, you know, way more than, than we could. Uh, so we decided to compete on culture. Culture is costly, but not nearly as costly as, you know, the things that people spend, you know, billions of dollars on. So um, we differentiated by building up what we refer to as a people first culture, where our people felt very valued, uh, our people felt very cared for, uh, they were invested in, and they just felt better working for our company than they did working for these other firms. So those were the two things that, you know, people, uh, you know, said they stayed for. And we heard that and we continued to, you know, invest and double uh, down on that. Now, we certainly lost a lot of people. People, you know, would go want to go work uh, for our clients and other uh, talent competitors. We didn't fight them. Uh, it was difficult. We embraced it. We built an alumni community. We stayed really friendly with our alumni community and it ended up being very symbiotic and it, and it, and it worked for us. Um, so that was how we, you know, chose to approach retention um, and you know, keeping the best people that we that we could. Cool. Monty, thoughts on, uh, on on culture and retention as you scale? Yeah, I mean, I think different than you guys, you know, I look at my answers more from an operational standpoint as far as opposed to, you know, what my multiples are coming out of it. But they end up being the same answer. You know, I, I tried to be a solo guy that ended up working out pretty well. Um, obviously, I was the big builder on the solo piece. And you just kind of start adding one person, two people, three people. Um, you know, once I got to five, it, it was hard for me to be, to stay being the big biller and give those people the support they needed. So I kind of found that there was a bridge that it's always the tricky time where you didn't cross that bridge from five to, you know, eight or nine people where you can completely get yourself out of any sort of, um, production was, that was pretty scary times, but you know, that was an intentional transition. And, and, you know, John was saying, these are the three steps, you know, I'm, I've been, through phase one, two, three, four, probably five right now, where once I got myself completely off of the desk and was able to keep building those people, then I just started asking myself, um, you know, why would they stay? Well, what kind of a situation would make them want to want to stay here as opposed to, you know, why not just go out and do something on their own? I feel like, you know, when you've got really great people, they should stay if you've got your compensation set, set up, if you've got um, where they're headed set up. Um, I even got to the point that, if you ask anybody at high country what Tuesday is, they actually refer to it as Monty Day. And I, I just assumed, right, I inherently knew that if I was there five days a week, every single minute, I was answering every single question. I'm taking this call from it is Tuesday. I'm in Evergreen. Um, they know that I'm not going to be in there. And I'm in there Monday morning, every Monday morning for the meetings to get everybody up and running and going for the week. Tuesday is the safe day to be out of there. So I'm like, you don't need to know where I'm at, whether I'm on a Zoom or whether I'm fishing or snowboarding or whatever. That is that is something that you, you need to figure out how to answer some of your own questions. And um, that's actually spun off into now I go down down to town, uh, down to Denver, Monday, Wednesday and Friday. So the people have to come up with their own solutions, their own answers. And, you know, eventually, again, this acquisition process for me will be eventually these people are they're going to throw me out. They're just going to decide that they don't need me anymore. Hopefully they don't hit me with a bus, but they're going to decide we've got this and they can all do their own thing. But you can still, you know, it's, it's been built on such a solid foundation that it's not this sort of tower of battle um, and I'm checking in and out. So to me, it's a, it's a process in each phase, you know, the acquisition phase will be the, the, the sunset phase for me, but it's just, it, it doesn't need to happen just yet, or maybe it does when people just have so much going on that they've, they've got it under control. Right. So let me shift just a little bit, uh, Bill, to there are people that might be watching this that have no fundamental background in M&A or valuation at all. Roughly, when someone at least understands what their EBITDA is or their adjusted EBITDA, how does valuation work? Uh, tell us just that rough formula where they can get a rough idea if they look at their last three years and if they know their EBITDA from talking to their CPA, how can they get a rough idea on what their current business might be valued at? Okay, so I'll try to answer this two ways. Very simply said, adjusted EBITDA, earn, EBITDA, not everybody knows what that is. Earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. 
If you don't know how to figure it out, you can either Google it or you can ask your accountant what your EBITDA is. The adjusted EBITDA is basically adding back any personal expenditures that you've spent out of the company or discretionary expenditures and adding those back. Why do you add them back? Because had you not spent those profits or spent those on yourself, they otherwise would have been profit to the company that another owner would have realized. If you're a very small company, you can find that adjusted EBITDA number or EBITDA number, and you can probably put a very simple factor on it, like three, you know, on a very low level. So if you've got $250,000 of adjusted EBITDA in the company, your company's probably worth $750,000. Um, that, that's a very simple way. Now, yes. there are a lot of, I'll just try to make this real brief, a lot of different uh, valuations are subjective. You can put a company in front of five buyers and every one of them is going to come up with a different price. Everybody thinks their method is the way. They look at a three-year average. They look at a twelve trailing 12-month average. You know, a lot of buyers want to look at the worst case scenarios to drive the price down to try to get themselves a better deal. Um, but we kind of, we have like a multiplier formula that we use um, that a lot of the banks are going to use because a lot of people are going to finance these businesses. Not everybody, but a lot are. And you want to make sure that that valuation is in line with what the bank is willing to lend on. Um, they're going to look at things such as what we've already discussed. We talked about team and organization. Is it company owner dependent or, it, or, or is the you know, owner absentee? And that's building that team. That's the difference of building that team or not. Um, historical financials. Um, I guess I got John M. and John over here. We'll, we'll go there. Uh, such as John uh, had said, you know, the history of the company. Is, the year, is there year over year growth? You know, do we have consistency? They don't want to see these ebbs and flows in the business. Um, so uh, having that year over year increased growth is going to help. Um, are you at $5 million of revenue, $10 million of revenue? Are you $5 million of EBITDA or $10 million of EBITDA? Each one of these is going to apply kind of a point to the valuation modeling. So we'll give you a point and a half for owner, uh, owner, uh, for not, for not being owner dependent. You know, we're going to add a point for being over $5 million. We're going to add another point and a half if you're over $5 million of EBITDA. Um, is there a recurring revenue model? Can we add an extra point for that? So there's kind of a formula that you can start to apply these, and that's why you get this big range of three to seven or three to eight on these multipliers. But back to the simple format. Oh, Bill, Look at quick question. Um, uh, I know um, Boris hit on it that there are these magic numbers, right? Like 10, 10 million top line revenue, 1 million profit or whatever. And, um, you know, sometimes people have a, a, a misperception or they have an assumption, but the assumption is not always right. Do you, how many firms do you see that are selling that are even under 3 million or under two? Is it common, not common? Uh, what appetite is there for buying search firms and of what size is in the market right now? It's a great question because a lot of the times I get people approach me and they say their first words out of their mouth is we're probably too small for you to sell us. That's, uh, but I kind of look at businesses as a used car lot. Not everybody can afford a Mercedes Benz. You know, some people might only have $500,000 that they want to spend on a company or a million. All companies are desirable to different buyers. There's a buyer for just about everything. I got a $2 million company. I want to add another 500,000 or a million dollars of revenue to my company. Um, and there's probably a pretty big buyer pool. Sometimes the smaller the company, the bigger the buyer pool, because it's an easy roll up. Some people have that kind of cash on their balance sheet. They can buy it. They don't have to bank finance it. Um, I would ultimately say, once you get to about $750,000 of revenue, which is probably going to equate to maybe two hundred or $300,000 of profit, depending how lean you run, that's kind of the threshold, right? Um, after that, it's people's assumption becomes, well, why would I sell my money, my company, when I can make that much money in two years keeping my business? Yeah, um, yeah, good points, good points. But um, so I, I think that's kind of, to a yeah, million. And, and I I don't want to go too long because we're, you know, approaching that that magic number on this podcast. But I want to ask real quick uh, lessons learned, uh, particularly of John McSpadden and Boris uh, and maybe even Bartos, because you guys have all acquired, been acquired. Sometimes it didn't work out all the way. So that lesson learned part of that question is what kinds of questions should someone ask of the buyer when they're getting to know who's going to buy them? Or what do you wish you had asked that you didn't? Uh, let's start with McSpadden. Then we'll go quickly to Boris and Bartos, and then we'll probably do some wrap up today. John? Yeah, lessons learned, man. That's, that's a lot. Um, you know, I was obviously pretty young when I sold my first ones. I was 11 years ago. I think I was 29, 30 years old, give or take. So I'm, I started this business at 22. So I'm kind of an anomaly there. But 
I think lessons learned, again, it depends on the structure of your firm, right? I mean, at that time, you know, I was a, you know, a big biller where 80, 90% of the revenues remained with me. So it was more of an aqua hire approach, right? Which if you're going to do that, it really comes down to once you get a little bit of the cash up front and your payouts that are going to be spread out over X term, right? You know, what it really comes down to your cash compensation, you know, year in, year out. Are you moving into a brand that's actually going to bring you an additional million, two million, three million dollars that you can into your practice or into your billings that you could then pocket? You know, what I've found is that if you become a big biller without a brand, you know, moving into a brand, it's going to have to be significant, right? It's going to have to maybe be like a corn fairy of the world, at least in my industry of executive search, that, you know, puts you, gives you a seat at the table. So, you know, my, my, buyout was more of an aqua hire approach right and every every uh, opportunity i've had since then has been more of an aqua hire approach right that's the reason as i mentioned earlier we've diversified you know our service offering because you know most executive retained search firms most contingent search firms are really started in the premise of a, of a big biller so it's really until you get to a certain level of scale in my opinion it's really hard not to get out of that aqua hire approach um and it's really gonna have to be i mean you're gonna have to show that you have multiple you know, you know, practice areas, big billers on your team. Are they retained? What do they look like if if, a, if if they acquire your firm moving in? So, lesson learned for me was was more you know negotiate as much if it's an aqua hire approach, negotiate as much upfront money as you possibly can. Um, get yourself in a better situation where you're de-risked. But more importantly, once that money runs out, you just have to be in a better brand and a better situation. And what I found is that nine out of ten times, that's just not the case. So that's one of the things you're really keying in on if you were ever to be acquired again, or it's just good advice for other people that, that might be being pursued. Uh, very good stuff. And, and one thing we didn't have a chance to dive into today is like, what if five, two to $3 million firms all got together really quickly and did a merger? You could be 10 to 15 million overnight. And then you are hitting those magic numbers that Boris was talking about. You know, World Bridge Partners was an example that did that. Princeton Search did in the, the space that uh, John Bartos and I came out of. So mm -hmm. that's a whole nother idea well, that could be out there. Well, real quick, Jeremy, I'll, I'll take like 30 seconds here and I'll stop. Yeah. That's actually what what we're working on now. Right. And I mean, uh, Alan, you work with a lot of CPA firms. It looks like I mean, we need to hook up after this call because I do a ton with accounting firms as well. You know, and there's been a lot of change over the last few years there, consolidations, PE firms have moved into them as well. You know, the one thing I've seen in the executive search side is, you know, they tend to scale, you know, typically quicker, right? So what we've been looking nationally, and I can't go down in the trenches on it because I'm under a CA right now, a confidentiality agreement with, with a PE group, is, is looking at your two, three, five million dollar search firms looking overnight, consolidating into one group, become a 20, $25 million firm, maybe 15 on the low end, and then start actually having buying power to then start looking at, okay, how do you add additional service lines, you know, staffing businesses, interim businesses, RPO, even moving the technology sector. So that's, that's something underway uh, that I'd love to hook up with anybody that's interested in that model after this call, because that's really what my next goal is in this business is how do you, how do you get to be a 15, 20, $25 million firm? Because we all know trying to do it at a three, four, five million dollar, you know, year run rate, you know, it's like taking a, a boulder uphill and a mudslide. You know, it's it's tough to get to <laughs> seven or ten million. So I'll, I'll stop there. But uh, Alan, love to hook up with you after the call, and I'd love to talk to anybody kind of about this strategy as well. Boris, uh, lessons learned uh, it, or just advice if someone's being pursued. Yeah, I, I wrote down a couple. Uh, there, there are many. Uh, one. Um, start planning uh, your exit. Uh, two years is the magic number. Uh, if you kind of do it, you know, off the cuff or spontaneously, um, you'll end up not being set up for optimal success in areas like um, well, optimal business setup, optimal profit setup. Uh, two, the tax planning uh, is a huge component of the you know, individual ultimate uh, earnout. Uh, the lifestyle associated uh, with um, acquisition. So a lot of planning goes into it. Uh, a lot of things to be set up for a more optimal uh, uh, post exit outcome. That's one. Two, um, two and three are kind of combined. Hire an attorney or partner with a broker who could you know, advocate as, as your attorney before you sign the LOI. Uh, a lot of things are specifically negotiated within the LOI. It's kind of like hand waved under the guise of non-legally binding, but a lot of you know components and terms are anchored in at that point. So if you're making a mistake, uh, waiting until after uh, LOI to hire that legal support. The, my, my third lesson learned was everything is negotiable way more than you think 
uh, is negotiable up front. Um, I spent a year uh, after getting acquired by Robinhood on the buy side. We helped acquire a couple of companies and everything is negotiable. Um, and so uh, a savvy attorney or a savvy broker will help uncover uh, those you know, things you didn't even know, you didn't even know uh, pre that LOI uh, component. And then the fourth thing I'll throw out there is exit sounds like an exit, but it's not really because there's always that period of kind of servitude uh, you need to uh, you know, complete in order to put, you know, consummate. So I kind of almost thought about my exit as like a step exit, um, but don't underestimate how long that post exit servitude period will actually feel. It'll all sound good and it'll be made to sound really great at the point of sale. Um, but at the the moment you've sold your company, it's not your company anymore. You're going to be you know, asked to fulfill on a set of responsibilities. Hopefully those set of responsibilities are ones you'll enjoy and find fulfilling, but just don't underestimate the like how, how long that will actually feel. Uh, Cause I've, I've spoken, I've, I've experienced and I've spoken with other founders who have kind of had to go through, um, you know, um, they've had to go through a lot of kind of like, you know, coming to terms with what, you know, with what they've done and, and, and where they are and the kind of extent uh, to which that needs to kind of, you know, be fulfilled. Uh, so just don't underestimate that. Um, going into it. Words of wisdom, people from folks that have been there and it's different if it's hypothetical versus it's you've been through it. So, you know, uh, John Bartos, what are your final thoughts? On this? Yeah, and I'll make it quick because I know we're running out of time a little bit here. So uh, my biggest shock was cultural change. Um, I remember uh, my first week uh, bring my whole team on into a new building uh, with another hundred folks out in the bullpen. And I remember uh, they told me four times the first week I need to quiet down. And I'm thinking uh, this, this, this might have been a tough decision here, you know, to quiet me down. You know, it was kind of crazy. But I noticed, I noticed right away I joined a uh, travel nurse, big uh, contract staffing firm. And I was executive search firm specifically in healthcare IT. So it, there was distinct cultural differences all over. And it was actually shocking to me, uh, the differences. The number two thing, and this will be my final, by the way, so then there are going to be a bunch of things here. But uh, the services that were offered to me uh, very gr greatly. For instance, it, it, we bring a company into Starfish Partners. They have a hiring team that does their hiring. They have unlimited capital they need to spend. They have a one-on-one -on -one coach. They have tech stack that you know, they get, and, and we get the best in workflow automation. So all of these services ready for me. I didn't have any of that when I got acquired the first time. It was just like me, and I couldn't talk very loud. They're looking at me. Wow, <laughs> to quiet down. It was just absolutely not. So oh, culture is important, and then what you get after the sale is very important in terms of the services taking you forward. That's awesome. Well, hey, hey, guys, I thank all of you uh, for joining us today, the different expertise. And, you know, if you're listening to this today and you are a search firm owner, big biller model, you're super huge, you're one year away from selling or or you're just getting started. I hope your takeaways are around how do I build my business so it becomes more profitable, more valuable and that you don't have the same assumptions that you might have had coming into today's call. Um, and the people that think big in terms of how am I going to grow and scale and that work on their business, not just in their business. Sometimes you got to get off that, that hamster wheel. And this is working on the business. That's what today's call was about. Uh, today's uh, video podcast was about. And so um, when you put a little effort into this, this is how people go from 1 million to 5 million to 10 million and beyond. And um, so hopefully it's been good for everyone. Continue the conversation in the thread. And uh, again, I'll, I'll probably hashtag all the folks on the call. And uh, we really appreciate uh, all, all of your time today. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, really enjoyable conversation. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks, Jeremy. See you guys.